In this SY4 screencast, we're going to introduce the world sociology topic by focusing on two key concepts, global inequalities and development. Okay, before we get started, just a quick reminder about the overall structure of the A2 course. There are two exams that you sit uh, next June. Uh, the first exam, SY3, is on this topic about politics, about uh, power and protest. And we're going to be spending two lessons a week on that particular unit uh, up until Christmas. And then the, the other unit, SY4, has two sections to it. There's a section on research methods and there's a section on world sociology, which is the work that we're starting for one lesson a week from now up until Christmas. And then after the Christmas break, we'll be doing, doing two lessons a week on SY4 and then one lesson a week uh, finishing SY3. And can you make sure that you follow the At Park Sociology Twitter feed and you can search for relevant tweets for this particular topic, World Sociology, by using the hashtag World Sociology. And Twitter's a really useful tool because I can flag up uh, interesting articles, uh, interesting videos that will enrich your experience of this particular topic. So let's get started on the World Sociology topic. And there are two key questions that this particular course uh, seeks to answer. And the first question is this one. Why are some countries rich and others desperately poor? Now in sociology we use this term, global inequalities, to describe the uneven distribution of things like wealth and income and opportunities around the world. And one simple way in which we can illustrate just how wide these inequalities are is through this champagne glass analogy. And this is a graphical way of illustrating global inequalities uh, in terms of income. So we can see at the top here that the richest fifth, the richest 20% of the world's population, have close to 83% of the world's income. Whereas at the bottom of this diagram, we can see that the poorest 20% are getting less than 1.5% of the world's income. And the reason that I think this graphic uh, works as well as it does is in part because it evokes uh, the too delicate feel of a champagne glass in hand. All that wealth at the top resting on so little. And therefore, this particular image, not only does it show us just how unequal the world is, it also uh, suggests that the wealthy are resting on the poor and that the balance is quite precarious. Now one interesting geographical factor to bear in mind when you're looking at global inequalities is this north-south divide. So most of the rich countries in the world are in the north. Okay, they're the countries in blue. Uh, there are a few exceptions. You've got countries like Australia and New Zealand that also are prosperous, but the vast majority of rich countries are in the north. And these richer countries that are in blue are sometimes also referred to as the minority world. And this refers to their share of world population. So only about 20% of the world's population live in these countries with the colour blue. Poorer countries in the world tend to be much more concentrated in the south. So in uh, Central and Southern America, in Africa... Uh, in parts of Asia. And sometimes we also use the term the majority world to describe these countries because about 80% of the world's population uh, live in these less economically developed countries. And of course we should also bear in mind that there are often big inequalities within countries. And this is true not just of poor countries, even in very rich countries like America there are often very big gaps between the rich and the poor within those societies. And these global inequalities have a huge impact on people's life chances. So people's opportunities to live a long and healthy life are massively influenced by where they live. And in class, um, I'll illustrate this through a very powerful uh, and moving documentary from the Why Poverty series, about variations in maternal mortality rates. So in some of the world's poorest countries, in sub-Saharan Africa, 
the maternal mortality rate is really, really high. So in a country like Nigeria, uh, in Western Africa, uh, one in eight women uh, die uh, as a result of uh, childbirth. So this issue of global inequalities is one of the core themes of the World Sociology course. The second core theme of the World Sociology course is development. And this is really about this question. How have some previously poor countries actually managed to develop to become relatively wealthy, whilst others have not? So Asia, for example, has doubled its global economic activity over the past 50 years. So there's been rapid economic development in many countries within this region. Uh, for example, if we look at the so-called Asian tiger economies of South Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong and Singapore, these are countries that have experienced rapid economic development uh, over the last few decades. Whereas in contrast, many poorer countries in sub-Saharan Africa have made little progress in terms of their economic development. So one of the central themes of the World Sociology topic is understanding the processes that influence development in poorer countries. However, there's a lot of debate about how we actually define and measure development and underdevelopment. And we shouldn't necessarily assume that development means that poorer countries have got to become more like us. In other words, we need to try to avoid what sociologists call ethnocentrism. So ethnocentrism is when you use the norms and values of your own culture as a yardstick by which to measure other countries that might have very different values and different norms. So we shouldn't necessarily assume that our cultures are superior to the cultures that you find within poorer countries and we shouldn't assume that the way in which we measure progress uh, should be generalised to other countries. Now, broadly speaking, development is related to the progress that a society is making in improving the quality of life uh, for its citizens. But as we've just seen, development is essentially a contested concept. People have different ideas about what counts as progress and the different ways in which we might go about measuring it. So when we're ranking countries in terms of their development, uh, where countries end up in our ranking system is dependent on how we operationalise development. It's dependent on the definitions and the measurements that we use. So a country like the USA might rank very highly if we're using economic indicators of development to do with wealth and income, but it would come near the bottom of a ranking system if we were looking at environmental indicators of sustainable development. So how we choose to operationalise development, which is in part always a value judgement, will end up shaping the data that we actually collect. Now traditionally there have been two main approaches to measuring development. There's been economic development, which focuses on things like wealth and income, and then human development or social development that focuses on key indicators to do with things like education uh, and healthcare. More recently, there's been a focus also on the environment and the concept of sustainable development. So in the next screencast, we focus on economic development and human development, and in a couple of weeks' time, we look at environmental indicators as sustainable development.